Hey guys, what's up? You know, I want to kind of give you my thoughts on something that I don't think any, you know, wrestling fan has ever really touched upon when it comes to, you know, looking back on, uh, uh, as I adjust the phone, the camera here, if you will, I do apologize. Uh, but like I said, I want to, you know, touch upon something that I have not seen, like, you know, many people, uh, when they talk about wrestling, especially wrestling uh, of the past, you know, really touch upon uh, when it comes to these certain moments. Um, first of all, I want to touch upon basically uh, 1996. And 1996, not just being a significant year in all of wrestling, because that, in the summer of that year, that's when things really changed, turned around for, for the better overall. But I, I want to talk about 1996 when it came to a certain... Uh, individual uh, in the World Wrestling Federation, the WWF, now the WWE. That, of course, is Tammy Stint, Tammy Stitch, um, Sunny, basically known as Sunny, um, in WW, WWF, WWE. And Sunny's character, of course, debuted with Chris Candido the year prior, and then they brought in Tom Pritchard to uh, be, um, you know, basically like a cousin or something like that. Um, as Zip, because Kristen Candido was Skip, and, you know, Tammy was Sunny. You kind of get the idea. The body Donna's. And uh, you you pretty much knew that they had big things planned for for Chris and Sunny, and then eventually when they got uh, Zip in there, they obviously had plans for, you know, for the both of them, um, if you will, um, as a team. And those plans culminated... Uh, with them winning the tag team titles in the tournament final in basically what would be dubbed as a buy-in, pre-show, kickoff show, if you will, uh, to WrestleMania 12. Basically, you know, they won it at WrestleMania, but on essentially what was basically an early equivalent of the kickoff show, as far as WWE is concerned, or a buy-in show, like what AEW would, would call it before their big events or special events. Uh, so, yeah, they ended up winning the titles. Uh, but then something interesting happened throughout 96 and into 97. And since this is 2022, I should say, this is 2022, um, it's hard to believe it's going to be 25 years when this really kicked off a lot more. I mean, we saw it a lot in 96, but we really saw it continue and get more emphasized um, in 97. And that was the fact that uh, we knew, like I said, that they had big plans for for all these um, individuals that were part of this group, but mostly for Sonny. Sonny, basically, before Sable came around at WrestleMania, was going to be the breakout star, you know, as far as the female um, contingent in WWF at that time was concerned. She was going to be the breakout star. She was going to be basically the Marilyn Monroe, you know, the... You know, ninth, the original, I guess you could say, ninth wonder of the world before China showed up. You, you get the idea. Anyway, um, anyway, basically, uh, like I said, they had a lot of plans for her. They had a lot of plans. And throughout 96 and into 97, we started seeing those plans really start to culminate. I mean, she became one of the more looked up uh, uh, ladies um, on the early stages of the internet, AOL, stuff like that. But what was interesting about her story arc, though, um, throughout 96, um, after the Donners won the tag titles and going forward, what was interesting about her story arc is they were basically uh, developing her not just into a ultimate devious, uh, an ultimate devious, uh, like heel, self-centered egomaniac of a heel, if you, if you will, who craved the spotlight and only wanted the spotlight on her. But the main thing that kind of kicked that off was the fact that they were portraying her as a gold digger. Now, if you want any more, if you want a more clearer context, I should say, if you want a clearer context, uh, basically in the later years of ECW, like 98, 99, early 2000, uh, Francine, characters like Francine and Don Marie uh, would be looked at as gold diggers. Uh, for example, with Francine, uh, they tried to keep her a faithful a little bit, but then they turned her into a gold digger. Like, basically, she aligned herself with Tommy Dreamer and, you know, and stuff like that. And 
you know, and then she aligned herself with Raven, Betraying Dreamer, and then she aligned herself with um, Just Incredible. And the main reasoning for her changing alignments was each of them had gold. Like, you know, Tommy and Raven, they became tag champs, so she hung out with them because they were champions. Uh, but the moment it looked like they could lose, she betrayed uh, Tommy, went with Raven because she felt Raven was a better opportunity to get championship gold again. And when that didn't happen, she betrayed Raven, went with Justin Incredible. And through Francine's own admission, through various shoot interviews and everything, it was... You know, her, it was basically her character's M.O. of, hey, you lose the title, you don't get special treatment from me if you catch my drift. And that was about it. And the same with Don Marie and, and, and a few other uh, female characters throughout ECW's run. Very, they had very similar uh, identical motives of, hey, you want some of this, you got to keep the gold and keep the money coming in. And Tammy's character was betrayed that, and Tammy's Sonny's, and Tammy's Sonny character was portrayed basically like that uh, in the WWF, WWE, back in the, you know, mid-90s, late 90s, 96, 97, uh, when basically what would happen is after the Body Donners won, um, she decided that in one of their title defenses to turn her backs on them and her line herself with the smoking guns. Thus, in a sense, doing a double turn. But the only reason she aligned herself with the smoking guns, as the storyline would probably uh, showcase, is obviously Billy Gunn, uh, before this all happened, was you know kind of developing feelings for her. Uh, she was, he was developing feelings for her, so he... So basically because he was developing these feelings for her, this thing for her, you know, he was able to convince Bart to... Um, you know, to, you know, you know, uh, you know, to go along with it and thus, you know, enable them to become the tag team champions. Now, what's interesting, though, is in between her transition from the body Donnas to the smoking guns, she also had a run with the Godwins. That's right. The Godwins originally were managed and mentored by Hillbilly Jim. But then Sonny came into their lives because Phineas, um, uh, basically a median, as he'd be later known, but Phineas Godwin started to develop a, a crush on her, and in story she noticed this and took full advantage of it, and realized, hmm, if he has a thing for me, and they want the tag titles, I can take that, make that my advantage. And you know, she basically uh, manipulated Phineas into, um, you know, doing what she wants and having her align with them, which. Again, threw a lot of people off. They were like, wait a minute, why Why is she going with Phineas and Henry Godwin, you know, and, and Hibbley Jim? What's going on here? This doesn't make sense. And just like the situation later on with the smoking guns, it was all due to the fact that, hey, you know, in storyline, she saw that inevitably the Godwins were going to probably become champions. So she figured, well, it's, you know, you know she pretty much figured, well, it's going to be now or never. What do I do? So, you know, and here's the thing. I didn't follow WWE that much back in 96 because, you know, I didn't get to watch it that much when I lived in Oskaloosa because the cable uh, company that we had that provided our cable uh, didn't have USA unless it was in a special package. So we only had TNT and TBS, which was good enough for me because I, follow, I was able to follow WCW. Uh, but the point I'm getting at is... I was able to pay attention to reading the magazines, to the various syndicated shows that they, I would still be able to catch. And basically, long story short, uh, Sonny turned her back on the body donors the moment they lost the belts. You know, it's like, I, I don't know if it was like, like maybe the following week or something, but she started to align herself with the Godwins. Like I said, she manipulated Phineas and Story to make him make it sound like she was turning good, she was becoming turning over a new leaf, and yet you had Henry and you had Hugh Billy Jim, uh, Jim, I should say, be very suspicious that you know there was more to this that she had different motives, and they turned out to be right because suddenly uh, they took on the smoking guns, 
And during the match, she, I'm assuming during the match, she turned her back on the Godwins and aligned herself with the smoking guns. Like, basically, in story, uh, she was okay with being with the body donors, but the moment they lost the belts to the Godwins, she aligned herself with them for the sole purpose of a, eventually, you know, aligning herself with whatever team beat them, in this case being the smoking guns. So that was her M.O. Her M.O. was, hey, you know, just like with Francine uh, in the later years of ECW and, you know, some other, you know, some of the other ladies there, her M.O. was, you lose the tag titles, you lose me. And that's what happened. And I think this ran its course from, I believe, like I said, throughout 96 and somewhat of 97, because um, afterwards, we didn't, you know, afterwards, I like guess we got towards 97, because like I said, it still ran its course a little bit. Uh, they kind of dropped it. They kind of dropped it, if you will. Now, I think they did try to resurrect it with her. In my opinion, I don't know any, I don't know much of the story. But I think they did try to resurrect it with her when she, uh, you know, managed the LOD as LOD 2000. But I, I don't think so. I think, you know, that was when they legitimately tried to turn her baby face. Um, but again, the, the MO before all that, that, you know, WWF, WWE tried to do uh, with Tammy Stinch's Sonny's character between, you know, ni you know, throughout, I should say, 96 and into 97 was portray her as a gold digger. Basically the kind that would turn her back on those that thought they could trust her because all she cared about was the fame and the fortune that came with the, came with the championship gold. And uh, again, I'm kind of surprised that not many people here on YouTube, you know, f you know, as far as wrestling channels are concerned, talk about that because even though it's not really much to talk about, it is something that when you look throughout 96 and some of the, you know, experimental storylines and characters that they were utilizing at that time, it's kind of surprising that this little story arc here with Sonny kind of gets overlooked. But it is something that when you look back, you know, you know, throughout 96 and into 97, it is something that when you look at, is, you know, is something to really pay attention because it does, at that time, paint her character as being exactly what I said. You know, being a gold digger that only cared about fame and fortune that came with championship titles, and that just like, you know, the ladies of ECW later on uh, were portrayed, you know, her character was lose the title, lose me. So again, I'm kind of surprised not many people touch upon that because it is an interesting kind of uh, story arc that, you know, gets look, that kind of gets pushed under the radar, if you will, when it comes to, like I said, the experimentation that WWE was going through at the time in 96 and 97. Right, so the other uh, story, the other wrestling story arc that kind of, you know, gets overlooked, kind of goes under the radar a little bit, you know, goes to WCW in 1999. Now, we know at the beginning of 1999, which was like 21 years ago, so it's old enough to drink now, <laughs> uh, we know that at the beginning, uh, basically we got what was known as the Finger Poke of Doom. Yeah, the Finger Poke of Doom is old enough to drink now, believe it or not. Uh, but anyway, we got that, and that led to the formation of NWO Elite, basically the NWO uh, Elite, which was, you know, the red and black and the black and white back together, but the red and black, the wolf pack was the elite, well, the, um, basically the NWO black and white was kind of like, let's say, um, what's the word I'm looking for? was kind of like, you know, kind of, kind of similar to what they're doing right now in, in AEW. It's like you have the elite, which currently consists of Kenny, uh, Kenny Omega, the Bucks, Matt and Nick, Adam Cole, and by extension, you know, Kenny and, and uh, not Kenny, but by extension, Kyle, Kyle O'Reilly and Bobby Fish, and somewhat by extension, the Good Brothers you know, who are in Impact Wrestling, but still, by extension, you have seven, you have seven members, seven to nine members, right? So, like I said, Kenny Omega, Matt and Nick, Adam Cole, uh, and by extension, you know, Bobby Fish, 
Kyle O'Reilly, you know, you have about, actually you have about six, seven members, right? You have seven, six, you, have, you know, you have six members. And when they're in, in the, and sorry about that, hold on. Sorry about that, the phone fell there, that was my fault. Uh, but like I said, you know, together they're known as the elite or the super elite. But when they're separate, they're known as, let's say, you know, the, the, uh, the, the click, they're known as the, uh, the super kick party, stuff like that. You know, very, very similar, very similar to what, you know, what happened, uh, very similar to, you know, what happened, like, 21 years ago. But again, that's what the NWA, uh, NWO, I should say, is, NWO's reformation was. The Wolfpack was the elite, you know, they were basically like the, the Kenny, the Bucks, the Adam Coles, and the NWO Black and White, by extension, was like the Kyle O'Reilly, the Bobby Fish, and somewhat the Good Brothers. You know, that's what they were. You know, that's what they were. And, um, basically, uh, what happened is they tried, is that WCW, they, they tried to keep these guys heels, right? You know, they, they tried to keep them as heels. As I uh, check something there for a second. Okay, I just started to start something. But like I say, they, they tried to keep these guys as heels. You know, they had them do some heinous things, like beat Ric Flair up in the middle of the desert, try to bury him, leave him for dead, stuff like that. But then what happened was, but then what I'm trying to say is, uh, what happened next was uncensored 1999. You see, like I said, they tried to make the NWO... Uh, Wolfpack Elite, or the NWO Elite, which, like I said, consisted of both groups uh, and everything, except the Wolfpack was kind of like the Elite is today, you know, the, like, Omega, Bucks, Cold Deal. Well, the Black and White was, like, by extension, the, the Fish and O'Reilly of today, along with the Good Brothers. Um, basically, excuse me, uh, basically, you know, they tried to set up, or tried to reestablish, I should say, the NWO uh, faction as being, being very, very heinous, very, you know, very heinous, very heelish, doing anything, des doing any desperate thing they can do, underhanded thing they could do to, you know, showcase, hey, we're still, in, we're still running things, we're still in control, right? But then, as I was saying, that's when Uncensored 1999 happened. And at Uncensored 1999, we had what was basically known as an unexpected double turn. Now, some people might say that didn't seem like it at first, but it was. And the reason I say that is because this was the first indication. I believe we got hints of it before, you know, leading up to Uncensored on, you know, on Nitro and Thunder. And I think somewhat Saturday night. You know, so we had hints of, like, we had seeds planted, I should say, of something going on, right? Of something afoot. And it wouldn't be until Uncensored 1999 where it would all come to fruition. You know, it would all come full circle. Because it was at Uncensored 1999 in the main event, which was the Bob Wire steel cage match between Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair, where basically, you know... Uh, we got, like I said, the essential double turn. The reason we got the double turn is because the barbed wire steel cage match was a first blood match. It had a first blood stipulation. And Ric Flair, you can overhear him say to Charles Robertson, you know, before the match start, started, you know, use your own, you know, discretion. Use your own discretion to stop the match. In other words, don't stop. In other words, if I'm bleeding... You know, usually that means stop the match, but use your own discretion. Like, if I'm bleeding, if you want to call the match, go ahead. If you don't, don't. You know, something like that. And you kind of got the feeling, even though it didn't seem like it at, at, that, at the time, you kind of got the feeling that something was going on. Like, why would Ric Flair, you know, make this matchup with this stipulation against Hogan and then tell the referee... You know, use your own discretion. In other words, telling him, don't, you know, call the match for any purpose whatsoever unless you feel you need to uh, in case, you know, a blood loss and something like that. 
So you kind of got that suspicion that something was up, even though it didn't feel like it. And throughout the match, throughout the match, you know, there was various times where the referee could have called the match because Flair was bleeding. He was busted open the hard way, you know, by the cage, by the fist of Hogan, by the barbed wire Hogan was bringing down, stuff like that. Um, you know, so he had various times to call the match, but he never did. He never did. And what was interesting about this is basically uh, towards the end of the match, you saw something you had not seen in a while. And even the commentating team, uh, Shivani and Bobby Heenan, you know, brought this up. You started seeing Hogan Hulk up. And you're like, wait a minute. He's been a bad guy, a heel, for at least going on three years. Two and a half years right now. He just reformed the NWO elite. You know, they just did all these heinous acts towards Flair and WCW. And yet, now all of a sudden, he's hulking up like a freaking baby face that he once was. What's going on, right? And that right there, that right there to me, you know, told the whole story. That when you saw Hulk... You know, being portrayed as a heel still at the time, hulking up, hulking up like he used to in the red and yellow. And, you know, Flair, you know, basically reacting the way he did and kind of cowering off a little bit. That right there told you everything like, oh, because when you look back on it, it you start to realize that, oh, we're essentially getting a double turn right here. I mean, because again... Going into the match, Flair's supposed to be the babyface. You know, he's supposed to be the savior of WCW. Hogan steals the heel and everything, right? But what happens instead? What happens instead? We get a double turn and Hulk, hulking up the way he did, even after everything he was portrayed, even after everything that he had done and, you know, been portrayed as doing, you know, with the NWO elite and stuff, and even the year prior with the Warrior and stuff, it's like all of a sudden he was acting like his old self. He was, you know, becoming a baby face again, even though, like I said, he was supposed to be the heel. And it was at that moment, and then, and, well, basically, I should say, what I'm trying to say is it was at that moment that you realized, along with, you know, the, you know, the beginning of the match when Flair said what he did to the referee Charles Robinson, you realized at that time, I'm, that, Something was happening, something, you know, something unique was going to happen, something you don't rarely see in wrestling was going to happen. And when Hulk hulked up the way he did, that's when you got your answer, that when you added in what happened, at the, you know, what Flair was telling the referee at the beginning, to what was going on throughout the match, and then this hulking up of Hogan, that's when it all came to fruition, along with the hints and everything, the seeds being planted the weeks before, that you were getting a double turn. And that, you know, instead of, you know, instead of Flair being the savior, the hero, you know, of WCW, he was being basically revealed to be nothing more than a self-centered, manipulative egomaniac who only cared about having power that, gain, that would allow him to gain and keep the WCW championship. Well, on the other hand, you were suddenly having Hogan become his old self again, even though he was still running the NWO. I know I sounded I know I made it sound more complicated than I should have, but that's pretty much what you got here. Long story short, the seeds that were planted in the weeks prior, you know, you know, you add those along with Flair advising the referee to end the match at your discretion or whatever, to what was going on throughout the match, to the hulking up you know, all culminated with a double turn. And then afterwards, then afterwards, I think the night after, you started to see the full, you know, double turn transformation uh, take place or occur right in front of you. You started seeing Flair act more heelish, more like the nature boy of old. You started seeing Hulk, even though the NWO elite was still a thing, you started to see him. You started to see Nash, by extension, you know, start to be more baby face, baby faceish, if you will. In other words, the NWO was now basically being portrayed as the good guys and stuff. 
So you start to see the full transformation and the fulfillment, you know, of the double turn coming all together. And you really started to, you know, get that sense, if you will, you really started to get that sense, if you will, that, you know, even after Hogan went out with the surgery for his knee, basically a surgery that wouldn't keep him out for long, but one he needed, you know, you you started to really notice this come to fruition as you got towards uh, Slamboree, you got to, well, you got to Spring Stampede, you got to Slamboree, you know, you know, place, you know, you know, um, you know, other events, nitro, other future nitros and thunders and stuff. You start to see, you know, basically the seeds that were planted beforehand, you know, before uncensored, and sort of the first roots of that of those seeds being planted, you know, sprouting up at uncensored. You start to see the full growth of it come to come to that, you know, culmination in the months and in, in the weeks and months that followed. Because one of the icings on the cake was Eric Bischoff. Eric Bischoff basically turned face, you know, I think, what was it, Spring Stampede, Slamboree, one of them? He had turned face. It's like all of a sudden, Bischoff was becoming everything he once was prior. And, uh, and again, this was all by extension of the fact that they were turning Hogan face again. Because, like I said, you had Nash turning face. You had some other members of NWO Elite turning face. Not much, but some. So you started to see that domino effect happening. And basically, long story short, when you add Sting to the equation, the Sting, the Stinger of the of the crow sti of the you know black and white face paint, when you have him come in, you have him added to the equation to basically address what's going on. It's like it, it, it's basically like the, the storyline they were telling was coming full circle. That even someone like Ric Flair, who tried to stand up for WCW, can get corrupted by power. That if he's given power the way he was given it, that even he, being who he was, can get corrupted, if not corrupted, a lot easier than, let's say, an Eric Bischoff. Because, here's the thing, Ric Flair in storyline was doing everything the NWO had done. He had co he manipulated. He was co manipulated the system. He was corrupting the system. He was, you know, abusing his power. He was paying off referees to side with him. You know, stuff like that. Stuff like that. And it was it was a, it was a very unique time because, you know, everybody assumed that the NWO was going to be heels throughout their entire career, which they essentially were. But this was one of those moments in time to where I think, you know, WC, the people at WCW, Bischoff and the others, they realized that, hey, the NWO Wolfpack got over big time as babyfaces. Why not kind of continue that, you know, you know uh, into 1999? But instead of just having it be Nash and, and Luger and, you know, and Sting and, you know, and, and Conan and all that by extension... Why not add in, you know, now Hogan? Why not bring Hogan into the picture, but at the appropriate time? And they pretty much figured the appropriate time would be uncensored because, you know, of all the seeds being, pla being planted leading up to it, with the roots taking, you know, with the roots basically taking hold, if you will, or growing out of that, you know, the stems, the, the roots growing out of that at uncensored, and then the full growth coming months later. So, yeah, again, just like with the sunny thing I mentioned earlier, this whole double turn thing with Hogan going babyface, even though he was still part of NWO, and Flair going heel, you know, at Uncensored, it, it, you know, and this all culminating with, you know, Flair basically going to the nut house, thanks to, you know, thanks to Sting and to an extent uh, Piper and stuff, you know. You know, or Sting, or Piper, Lee, Piper basically sending Flair to the nut house, and then, you know, P Flair coming back, aligning, Piper aligning with him, and then Sting, and then that thing dissolving, and then Sting basically coming in and being the one that took the power away and then gave it to the right, you know, people. You know, again, th even though, like I said, even though this, like I said earlier with the Sunny thing situation, even though 
this is a story arc that I made sound a lot more complicated than it did. When you get down to it, it's a story arc that not many people talk about because it's overlooked and it flies under the radar. But it was essentially one of the first, uh, in one of the first, you know, rare instances of a real double turn happening right in front of you, and you just didn't see or playing out, playing out as well, I should say, and you just didn't see the results of it until basically the next night, you know, and in the weeks and months to follow, and, and then culminating with the match between Sting and Flair for the presidency on Nitro, and that was about it. That was about it. So, yeah, it's one of those unique story arcs that even for WCW, you know, flies under the radar and gets overlooked because of its uniqueness. I mean, double turns are rare. Let's be honest. They are rare. But the way sometimes they are done, and if they're done, you know, but like, what I'm trying to say is sometimes the way they are done, they are done in a way that really makes you think, hmm, this might be something we could go back and revisit over time and try to see if we can pull it off once again. And that's about it. That's about it. So, to me, it's one of those story arcs that, like I said, with the Sunny thing in 96 and 97, that this thing in 99, you know, it's overlooked, you know, and under the radar. But it's one that if you, again, you go back and watch the, the Nitros and all that and the Thunders and everything leading up to Uncensored 97... You see those seeds being planted, and then at ninety-seven, uncensored ninety-seven, you see the root, you see the the roots basically, you know, taking place, if you will, grabbing hold, and then afterwards you start seeing the growth of the of that tree, if you will, uh, come to fruition when in the weeks and months that followed. So yeah, uh, overall, it's a story arc that I think a lot of people, you know, under, you know, uh, underestimate. Being a potential, you know, somewhat potentially good, and and it's one that again, like I said, with the Sunny deal, you should go back and check out. Okay, so essentially, even though I know I made it sound a little bit more convoluted than I should have, the point is when you look back at the Sunny story arc between or throughout '96 and somewhat the beginning of '97, you know, and her basically being portrayed as a gold digger, basically uh, the kind of character of, uh, you know, that was like, hey, you lose the championship, you lose me kind of deal. You know, it, it's one that's underappreciated and overlooked, and I do believe people should check out to really get a better context of why it was so, you know, I, I guess so, um, so utilized as much and why it kind of helped put Sonny on the map, you know, in WWE. And then when you look at the whole WCW uncensored thing between the double turn, basically between Hogan and Flair and the seeds that were being planted in the weeks that were leading up to it, and then the roots that took hold during the double turn at uncensored that grew into what they did in the weeks and months that followed, you know, it's, again, one of those kind of story arcs that, you know, doesn't get much appreciation because it's a double turn that rarely happens. It really happens in the way that it did. I mean, with Bret Hart's double turn at WrestleMania, we, we kind of saw that coming for months. You know, the frustration and everything, it was being, it was, very, it was pretty much very clear he was going to turn heel um, very soon. And that's exactly what happened. He turned heel. But with, you know, but with this double turn two years later, it was done in a way that, well, basically, you know, you could potentially see coming, but it was done in a way that made it seem not so obvious. Even though the seeds, like I say, were being planted, it was still, it, it still made you wonder exactly what was going to happen and all that. And then when you got to the match, the, you, know, ref, you know, Rick telling Charles Robinson what he did, you know, and then what happens throughout and then the hulking up, you kind of get the idea that, you know, there was something happening that rare, you were seeing a double turn happen in a way that rarely happens in the business, you know, even today. So I highly recommend checking them both out, guys. And that's really all I'm going to say. So till next time, take care. God bless. Let me know what your thoughts are down below in the comment section as well as in the live chat during the premiere. Like the video. Check me out at my Teespring store at BWRosis. 
Well, not my teeth bring, well, what I'm trying to say is check me out on my teeth bring story today, but also check me out at B.W. Rose's discussions on all your favorite audio podcast locations except for Pandora. I am close to 300 podcast guys. And if you're listening to the podcast on Anchor.fm, listener support is activated if you want to help support me there. And if you are listening to the podcast on various podcast affiliates like Spotify and Amazon Music that enable uh, video podcasting as well, then you have your choice of two different variations of the podcast to listen to or watch. Also check me out at BW Roses on Vimo. Also check me out at patreon.com slash BW Roses to support me at the $1, $3 tier. I am considering, like I said, a $5 tier for Q&A. But if I do, I will make that announcement. Don't hold me to that just yet. And also check me out at Venmo at brian walmer 2 But yeah, give me your thoughts on these two as I look at it. Um, basically, 